Hey all, I always thought this was kinda boring since it never got resolved, and it's really short, but after a suggestion, I thought I'd recount everything I remember here, and maybe some people will find it interesting slash entertaining. This was a very long time ago, when I was a kid. I was home alone one hot summer evening. My parents were out on business, and I was enjoying the time alone to do whatever I wanted. We lived in a two-bedroom first-floor apartment at the time. From the front entrance was a hall that opened into the kitchen. To the left at the far end of the kitchen was my room, and to the right of the kitchen was the living room, which connected to a small den. My parents' bedroom was also connected to the living room off to the right. It was around 9pm when I just finished dinner, and I began my nightly routine of taking out the trash, brushing my teeth, and shutting down for the night. Before retreating to my room, I opened all the windows in the kitchen and living room so that the house would cool down over the night. The windows were all barred, so I wasn't too worried about any funny business happening. I am a little bit of a security freak, so all the doors in the house have locks, including my bedroom and the bathroom as well. So I shut off all the lights and went to my room to watch TV, and at around midnight I dozed off. I had a weird dream, or rather nightmare, of someone knocking on my door, with the knocking getting progressively louder. It was odd because in the dream, I was laying in my bed, but I couldn't move. The knocking got so blaringly loud until I couldn't stand it anymore, and then I heard a scream, and I woke up. And my heart was racing, and I was sweating a little bit as well, but no damage done. I looked around my room and glanced at my alarm, which read 4am. Seeing nothing out of the ordinary, I brushed the dream off and laid back down. I closed my eyes, and suddenly I heard knocking on my actual bedroom door. A little delirious, I thought I'd slip back into my nightmare. My eyes shot wide open, and I sat up and stared at my door trying to listen. There were three slow knocks that followed. My very first thought was that my parents were back early with food or something, and they wanted me to have some. My dad was notorious for knocking on my door when he got home late at night so he can check up on me, sometimes without calling my name first. I always told him it spooked me, and he should announce himself when he knocks on the door, but he always forgets. So I got up and began walking towards the door, but something felt so wrong. When my parents come home, there's usually commotion. They might be having a conversation, or I can hear their keys jingling, my mom's heels, footsteps, something. This time though, it was dead silent. I stopped halfway to the door and called out. Who is it? No answer. I opened my mouth to call out again, but before I could get the first word out, there were several rapid knocks on the door. Very persistent knocks, as if somebody was in an emergency and whoever was on the other side needed to get in now. I then felt a lump in my throat. My mind was racing and the first thing I thought of was what if it's my dad on the other side and he's in trouble? What if he's choking and he can't speak? What if he needs my help? I was frozen in place and I couldn't move. I said, who is it? Once more. Again, nothing. Please, say something. Please tell me who it is. It's not funny. I said. A few moments of silence went by. Suddenly, it was as if someone threw their whole weight onto the door. Rapid, loud bangs began attacking the door. Kicks, punches. It was as if there were three people on the other side trying to bang the door down. It was so loud that I started crying. I found myself jumping backwards and then crawling to the corner of my room. The violent banging went on for a few more moments and then there was silence. I sat in the corner, frozen. My hands were covering my mouth and tears were rolling down my cheeks. I honestly thought that this was the end. 
I was shocked the door still stood because when I heard the first bang, I thought the frame would come crashing down and whatever was on the other side would instantly enter and end my life. But I sat there for a period of time that felt like an eternity. Suddenly, I heard clinking, the sound of metal brushing into each other. I knew whatever was on the other side was going through the silverware drawer. If my life didn't end already, this was my last chance because I wouldn't get another one. I sprang up and climbed onto my dresser, which was sitting against my window. I then threw open the curtain and shoved the window down and climbed out as quietly as I could. I fell to the sidewalk and then ran to the police station down the road. I was hysterical and then told them what had occurred. That night, my parents were called and they did an investigation of my house. The only things out of place were a cigarette butt left at the base of my bedroom door and a butter knife on the kitchen table. In the following months, we moved out of that apartment and thankfully I can say that was the most excitement I'd ever been through. I soon went to college, graduated, moved to a brand new state with my family nearby, and life is continuing as normal. I'll never know if it was a prank that night or somebody was actually out to get me. But whatever, whoever you are, let's definitely never meet. The year is 2008. The location, Francis Scott Key Mall. I'll never forget the day my instinct saved my friend. I had gone to the mall with my childhood friend Sarah. We'd actually been catching up, I never had many friends in school, and in high school, me and her never had the same classes, and life outside of school for me was mostly sleep, so this was as good of a time for us to catch up. Sarah was petite, small and skinny, but I'd never call her frail. I was a tall, heavy-set dude with a bad limp. She would often joke that she felt safer with me, because I looked like a big scary bear, and the limp made me looked like a badass who always won. Sarah always knew I hated being seen as scary and would often tease me, but this mall would be no cakewalk and no different. After about two hours of walking around, we had been leaving Hot Topic, and that's when I felt like I was being watched. Like we were being watched. I finally caught eye of some guy in sunglasses, a tan shirt, gray jacket, and black dress shoes looking at us from across the center of the mall. The most offsetting thing was him. He was clean cut, clean shave, short black hair. Everything about him screamed official, but his clothes looked like he had just grabbed them off the floor and tossed them on. At first I thought he was a cop in regular attire and that I had once again been falsely accused of stealing. A little bit of background. The owner of the mall's Walden Books had taken a strong disliking to me. After I accidentally busted their theft sensors two years ago, but he never said anything nor got close to us to try and stop us. I decided I wanted to see what he was really up to, so I led me and Sarah into Sears, and sure enough, he followed us. I didn't tell Sarah about him, but made a decision. There was a hall to our left for restrooms down by the service base and waiting room, and a good 12 or so feet ahead was electronics. I asked Sarah to wait for me by electronics while I went to the bathroom. Now I know for sure as we had passed the hall that this would mean I'd have to turn around and walk towards him a bit and then down said hall. His pace slowed down a bit when he saw us splitting up. I glared him down as I came his way and then turned down the hall pretending to look at my phone, using it as a mirror. He clearly looked at me as his head turned, but he then continued straight on past the hall. I turned into the bathroom doorway, and as soon as he was beyond view of the hall, I turned around. My turn, I muttered to myself, and laughed a bit. I felt like a kid playing spy. I had guessed that this guy might notice me, so I came out of the hall and made my way towards tools. The tool section wasn't separated by any walls, but just by the walkway giving me a clear view and cover behind toolboxes and shelves. 
He was following Sarah now, but still keeping a good distance. What annoyed me about this was Sarah never got the feeling of being watched and looked over like I had. In fact, both times she looked at him had been only as turning to look around the store. Now I needed to know, but I wasn't going to cause a scene. Or so I thought. I walked over from tools. Sarah saw me coming and joined me. We went back into the mall and then headed for a mall exit. Sarah had started to ask me why we weren't heading towards our cars, but a simple hand motion for me cut the question out. We walked outside, and he was a considerable bit behind us, so I rushed us through the two sets of doors, giving them time to close. We walked to the edge of the overhang and stopped. I explained everything while pretending to look for our cars, and then turned around. In the area between the doors, there he stood, and now he had no way to avoid both of us seeing him directly. He walked back in, and he had turned standing against the side wall. I now stood in front of him. What's up, chief? I asked, mocking a cop. Not a smart idea, but if he was a cop, or even mall security, then he'd now have to call me out. The thing is, he wouldn't look directly at either of us. Gonna say I stole something? I've been minding my own business. How about you mind yours? I was now projecting at him. But he said nothing, and even having raised my arms at him, he didn't move and didn't look at either of us. I opened the next door and waved Sarah through, stopping the door, almost touching his face. Sarah had hurried on ahead of me. I stepped through, and the next few seconds remained frozen in my mind. He sighed, almost as if relieved I hadn't hit him with the door. I walked in and took a slow pace, and sure enough, he followed. However, he hadn't noticed that I was now walking backwards. I backed right into him, and my upper arm caught the feeling of a holster under his arm as we bumped into each other. Now, at the time, in that state, concealed carry by civilians wasn't legal. I now knew that something was entirely out of place. I was pissed off, but I was also lucky as mall security rounded the corner to the exit. Gun. He's got a gun, I yelled. He backed away from me as mall security came running up with a taser drawn. She's lucky you're so annoying, he had muttered as he continued backwards towards the exit and the mall security followed. I didn't stick around to find out anything. I ran for Sarah and grabbed her wrist and then took off through the mall towards the security office. But the head of security in the office was not exactly thrilled to see me but was aware of what had gone on. Now, apparently they had been watching us since we entered Sears, and the tape showed them that this man had been following Sarah since she parked, and had actually only started trying to hide himself when she met up with me. With the most unreal part of all this though, they caught him, but released him when he produced an official government ID and number. To me, I don't care if he was God himself, this isn't the type of behavior that you just let slide. I met a guy online, talked for a day or two, but I was at the tail end of my degree and things were getting to be a lot, so I decided no dating until I was done. So I let the handful of guys that seemed nice know this before deleting the dating app so they would know why I deleted it and wouldn't think I ghosted because of them. He happened to be online when I sent it and said that I seemed pretty cool and can we keep in touch. I said sure, no worries and added him on Facebook. Maybe once a week, he's like, hey, how are you? What are you up to? Normal conversation stuff. I chat about university, work, gym, whatever. After maybe two to three months, he's like, Hey, we've been chatting for a bit. Well, let's grab a coffee. And I'm like, Yeah, sure. He seems nice enough. I reiterated that it was going to be as friends only, and that was fine with him. I was about to head into exams, so we made plans for in three weeks' time after I finished exams. He started messaging me more and more regularly after making plans, more than once a day. He then starts calling it a date, 
which people call catching up a coffee date without it meaning an actual date, but I wanted to make sure we were still on the same page, so I just said, hey, you keep calling it a date, just making sure we're clear, it's just a catch up as friends. He snapped. He was sending me all sorts of horrible things on Facebook, so I ended up blocking him. I gave him my number when we made plans though, so I started calling and calling and leaving voicemails. It was so late, I put my phone on silent and went to sleep. By the next morning, I wake up to 37 missed calls and voicemails between 10pm and continuing until 4am as well as multitude of horrible text messages. Now, this was 7 years ago when you couldn't just block someone on a phone. At first I thought if I ignored him he would get bored. After about a week, he wasn't slowing down. There were dozens of calls a day. I called my phone company to have him blocked. They said you can only block three people, are you sure? I had to jump through all the hoops, and then they turned around and said they can't do it, I have to call the police. So I call the police, and they say I have to call the phone company, but I can make a statement of harassment in case he does something more. Three weeks later, he's still going strong, but in his text messages, he starts saying he's going to force me to go on a date with him, I won't have a choice, blah blah blah. Then he starts saying that if I won't come to him, he will come to me, and he's telling me my schedule with where I'll be at any given time, which he put together based on our weekly conversations about normal things, threatening to come to where I will be, etc. I have to stop doing my regular activities, and pretty much became a hermit. He ended up making a threat to my life, and I can't remember what he said word per word, but it was essentially, girls like you get what they deserve, or something like that, but more clearly threatening he would be the one to make it happen. I ended up contacting the police again, and that was enough for a violence restraining order, and I never heard from him ever again. Oh, yeah, and by the way, I was 20 years old, but his pictures looked younger, so I didn't realize online, but it turned out that this guy was 34 years old, so this wasn't some dumb young kid behavior, this was a grown ass man. Now, I've had many other psychos since this guy, but I'm very grateful that phones have since allowed you to block anyone at any given time. In 2008, I worked at a retail clothing store with my girlfriend Chelsea. We were both 18 years old and we tried to work as many shifts together as possible so we could maximize our time together because she was still in school. My grandfather had recently purchased a Dodge Sprinter van for his business and my car was being serviced on overnight so I got to drive the van. Chelsea and I loved the nights that we got to take the van because it usually had the back seats installed and the tinted windows meant that we would have some privacy, which is great for teenagers who still live at home. That night, we only had one row of seats in the back and it was the row that was just behind the driver and passenger. Chelsea and I parked near each other like we always did and worked our evening shift closing the store with a few of our co-workers. We all leave together and I help the manager lock up because the glass doors need to be aligned properly for the lock to engage. It's early March in Pennsylvania and it's still pretty cold outside so Chelsea usually starts her car to warm it up and then sits with me as my car warms up. When I got to the vehicles, her car is idling and she's already in the van. I don't even realize that I still have the keys with me and I never unlock the doors. She sits with me chatting for a while, she sits on my lap, and we kiss in the front seats, and we decide it's too late and too cold to have a little bit of fun in the back. Every night we drove home separately from work while talking on the phone. She usually gets home first, and I stay on the line while she walks up her long driveway in the dark. That night I made it home first for some reason, and I knew I had a lot of stuff to carry in, so when I'm close to home, I tell her I'll call her in a little bit. 
She asked me to stay on the line because she is almost home and she doesn't like walking past the dark bushes next to her driveway. So I stay on the phone and fumble with all my things I'm carrying out of the van. I know I locked and armed the van because as I was using the key fob to lock the vehicle, I dropped a few things while struggling to keep the phone in my ear. The motion lights have illuminated the whole area, so I'm able to see everything that I dropped. We both make it inside safely, and we also decide not to stay on the phone because she had school in the morning. I then began to doze off almost immediately in my bedroom. I lived with my grandparents, who built a house to accommodate my grandfather's aging parents, who were suffering from Alzheimer's, my great-grandparents, so they didn't have to go in a home. The driveway runs parallel to a daylight basement that has two garage doors, an entrance door, and the French doors to my bedroom. I'm falling asleep as all my motion lights finally turn off, and now my room is completely dark. It wasn't 20 minutes later when I'm jarred awake by the alarm sirens of the van. All the motion lights are on, and the flashing lights of the van alarm are filling my room. I left the key fob upstairs in the main part of the house, so I run upstairs to silence the alarm. In the kitchen, as I'm grabbing the fob, my grandfather in his boxers, my great-grandmother in her nightgown, and I in my boxer briefs all meet in the dark. My grandfather grunts as he sees me grabbing the fob, but what my granny said sent shivers down my spine. What in the Sam hell are you doing running around outside at this time of night, darling? I wasn't outside. I explained that I was sleeping, but she insisted that I was the one outside making the van alarm. My great-grandparents' bedroom sits above the garage doors, which look down over the driveway and the van. Now, I'm assuming that she's confused. She has Alzheimer's, after all. The goosebumps from her exclamation, though, prompted me to grab a knife from the butcher block anyway, and my grandfather followed with a baseball bat. We both walk outside warily, in our boxers, in the cold night, but highly illuminated, and loud, dead of night. The van is still going crazy. The interior lights are all flashing. And I remember that specifically, because I'd never seen a car alarm do that before. So we silence the alarm and start looking around. My grandfather says he thinks a deer may have been running out of the woods in the dark and then hit the van. I don't say anything as we investigate. When I reach the back of the van, I notice the door is wide open. Well, that explains the alarm. The van has a feature that if the vehicle alarm is armed and a door is open somehow from inside or outside, it alarms. But how? I locked it and armed it, hence the blaring alarm. But that's when I realized that the door was open from inside. My blood now ran cold. The door is open so the inside lights are still on. I see the empty space behind the row of seats and there are wadded up napkins and a chip bag as well. They weren't ours. Somebody was inside the van with me the entire time. I must have left the van unlocked by mistake when I went into work, and that's how Chelsea was able to get inside the van without the keys at the end of the night. Was it a homeless person escaping the cold, or someone with a more sinister of an intent? What if I had gotten off the phone like I wanted to? If they had ill intent, the fact that I was on the phone might have saved my life because Chelsea would have raised hell if she heard me being attacked. I get the chills every time I think about it. We didn't call the police because my grandfather was skeptical of my conclusion, but my gut tells me that I didn't drive home alone that night. So, person in the back of my van. Let's not meet. When I was 18 years old, I got a job at Walmart, small town, not much else there for someone fresh out of high school. I had been there for about a month, and I worked in the jewelry department, usually from mid-afternoon until the department closed at 9pm, and I would close the department by myself. But Obviously, Walmart is open 24 hours, 
so other people were always around. And one night, I'm locking the cases up and putting things away, and an overnight stalker walks by and says hello. I look up, smile, and I say hi back, and then go about my business. This guy, the only way I can describe him is to say he looks like one of the Bee Gees, shoulder length frizzy hair, kind of a bouncy hop to his step when he walked, mid fifties. This started to become a regular thing, on nights I closed by myself. He would walk by and say hello, and I would say hi back. That's it. No conversations ever took place. Then, on my birthday, a few of my friends who worked there got me a cake, and I hugged them and said thank you, etc. About an hour later, Mr. BG's comes around with a birthday card and gave it to my manager to give to me. The manager thought it was extremely funny that this weirdo got me a card until I opened it. Happy birthday. I saw you hugging those guys earlier. It made me really mad, but I called a friend and talked it out with them, and he made me realize you're allowed to have friends other than me. Just please don't hug them anymore. Save those hugs for me. Now, I don't know what kind of emotion showed up on my face, but my manager grabbed the card and then read it, and then walked me back to the store manager's office and showed it to him. The store manager said the guy was obviously joking, but that he would talk to him about it. I didn't see Mr. BG's for around a week, until one night, while I was closing, he plunked down a stuffed envelope on my counter as he walked by without a word. Inside were six pages front to back of pure crazy. It was basically his entire life story, all about his family and schools that he went to, but with weird stuff like how his sister was a psychic and his father was an exorcist, and all sorts of weirdness. The end of the letter was about how his friend, who was 18 months old, was missing and he knew that she was being raped because he could hear her screaming in his dreams. Like, what the hell? So that also went to the store manager and he had me write a written complaint and told me not to go outside by myself and not to wander near where the guy might be while I'm on my breaks. Yeah, more like get rid of him. Two nights later, I was finishing up for the night and the way the counter is set up, there is one opening and the counters go all the way around both sides. He brought a hand cart around with boxes from my department, but pushed it into the only opening in the counters, so I was basically trapped inside. He just stood there and stared at me, while I looked at him with what I'm sure was a face of terror. I was then, and still am now, riddled with anxiety. I don't like confrontation, and the last thing I wanted was for this weirdo to confront me about me reporting him, twice. He whispers, Sorry, I didn't mean to scare ya. I turned around and started finishing up my closing tasks, pretending he wasn't there, even though I could feel him watching me. After a few minutes, I just looked at him and said, Weren't you told to stay away from me? He gave me this gross predator grin and said, The store manager's name. He asked me if I was joking. I told him I was. Then he leaned in as close to me as he could, with a counter between us, and he whispered, The thing is, I'm not joking. Then he walked away. For two weeks after that, he would randomly show up wherever I was. I would leave for lunch, and he would be there, even non-work places. I would go to the mall. He would be there. Another department manager told me that he had been reported by four other people, over the last two years, for a very similar behavior. I again went to the store manager, who told me the guy was harmless and maybe had a little bit of a crush on me. He was in his 50s, and I was 18, almost 19 years old during this crap. A week later, I gave my notice, and I quit. He still works there, 13 years later, and it still gives me the heebie-jeebies. So, for context, I'm a 22-year-old male, 
and I live in a large city in the Midwest. I drive for Lyft while putting myself through trade school. I drive for other similar companies as well, but that's besides the point. I have many horror stories from those as well, but I'll tell those another time. It was Christmas Eve, 2020. I was out running Lyft for a few hours before heading to my mom's house with my brand new baby and wife. Nothing special going on for the night, just the usual. I got a ride request. It was a pickup from this kind of lower income apartment complex. No big deal. I arrive and I find my passenger. He has all his belongings. Several boxes of stuff. Now my car is a 2006 Chevy Impala, so it's not too big. We got all his stuff loaded up, barely, and we're on our way. During the ride, he's crying and saying his girlfriend was cheating on him and he had walked in on them earlier that night. He couldn't stay there because it was her name on the lease, so I was taking him to a hotel. Now in my city, we have a street that is well known for having vices, hookers, drugs, gangs, weapons, and shady motels, the works. We get to the motel and he asked me to wait for him to check in and get his key. No problem, man, I say. I'll confess, I break the rules a little bit when it comes to lift. I have a gun hidden in a concealed holster secured to the underside of my driver's seat for protection. The reason being is driving lift and other contract apps. I've had knives and guns pulled on me as well as people have tried to fight me, rob me, all kinds of other things. But like I said, another time, this motel was on that street I mentioned before. Homeless people were everywhere. There was a dude on the far corner of the complex that still had a needle in his arm, passed out against the building, and I'm not a big fan of true crime and horror narration, so I'm pretty on the edge. He gets his key, the whole motel is ground level, so to help the guy out I drive to his door. As I mentioned before, he had a lot of stuff, so I started to help him unload his stuff. While on my second trip getting stuff, I saw a guy come out of a room just to the south of my car, followed by two ladies. They came up to the room I was next to, not my passenger. One of the ladies pounded on the door and then opened it. That's when I saw the guy raise his shotgun up out of his long coat and storm into the room. The two ladies followed him, slamming the door behind them. Following, I heard a lot of yelling and shouting. I was just waiting for shots to ring out. Out of nowhere, my passenger came up behind me. I can take this man. Go ahead and take off. Have a Merry Christmas. And he gave me a cash tip. I didn't even notice he took the boxes out of my hands or slid the $5 bill in my pocket. I was just frozen. I knew what might have been going down in that room, but I had to leave, or at least get to where I could get to my gun. I know the guy and both ladies saw me, and I knew they knew I saw the gun. I had to get out of there. You know, no witnesses. I got in my car and sped away quickly. I got a block or so away and then proceeded to call the cops, and I gave them every detail I could. After I got off the phone with the police, I signed at a lift. I hadn't made much money, but I was done. I got a call later that night. The cops investigated. They never found the gunmen or the women, and they never answered the door that I saw them come out of. And also, the occupants of that room that they went to said that nothing had happened and that I was full of shit. Well, I know what I saw. So to the gunman I saw with a shotgun, who I'm sure was making a statement to someone about a debt, let's not meet again. TLDR, crazy guy took a shotgun into a hotel room and raised it upon entering, closing the door behind him. This story takes place when I was 17 years old in a small border town that I grew up in. 
I lived in a house on a steep hill, and I took the bus every morning and after school to come home. Classes started very early, and no other students lived on my small street. It must have been during the winter because it was very cold every morning, which isn't a usual thing where I lived. I remember being afraid every morning because it was very dark outside, and I only had the light of the moon to guide me, and back then cell phones didn't have flashlights that you can use to guide your way in the dark. There were only three other homes on my small street, and they were all on a big hill with paved driveways going down and meeting a gravelly road. The houses were arranged around a gravel cul-de-sac, which many people used to turn around if they went down the wrong road. I live in a desert area, so there were leafless mesquite trees and cactuses around, to where it was very reminiscent of a forest or dense flora area. It was so quiet that all you can hear were the bats that were fluttering around the one street light that decided to work on the off day, but usually it was just pitch black, along with the yapping of coyotes and crickets chirping. Other than that, all I could hear was the crunching of the gravel beneath my feet. The first time I saw the man in a van, I wasn't that surprised. A lot of the time, we would just get these white vans passing through because they delivered the papers to the surrounding homes. I then started to realize that this van would stop right next to me when I was standing alone waiting for the bus to arrive. There was a stop sign there, but there was no reason for the person in the van to be stopped there for 10 minutes until the bus picked me up. He must have started to get brave after that because he would roll his windows down and ask me if I was cold. I'd say yes and ignore his presence and pretend like nothing happened. I just figured he was trying to be nice. He was an older Hispanic man in his 70s. Again, the next day he pulls up even closer to me. Are you cold? You look beautiful today, but you look so cold. This time I just ignored him and waited for the bus to pull up and I got in. I would watch his van pull away after my bus left. He kept doing this for two weeks until one day he looked at me through his window and said, I could use a pretty girl like you. It's cold outside. You must be so cold. Come inside my van and I'll keep you warm until your bus gets here. I looked at him in horror and luckily the bus pulled up a few seconds later and I decided I needed to tell someone about him. My dad is in law enforcement and I told my dad what had been happening. He asked me what he looked like and when the van would pull up. He said I should have told him sooner, but he's glad I told him when I did. He called the police and I told the police what had been happening. They said that they had similar reports in the area and that they would catch him. The next day, the police hid behind me where the cul-de-sac is and I stood in my usual spot where I stood for the bus. I remember that day the street light was finally working and I could see the man's face in the van. He didn't realize the officer was there until he made a full turn around the cul-de-sac and started towards me. The police turned their lights on and pulled him over. I could hear him yelling as the bus pulled in and I left for school. I could then see the police lights glaring on the bus windows. The following day my dad sat me down and he told me he had to talk to me. Apparently, the man had many suspicious things in the van. He had duct tape, plastic bags, zip ties, condoms, lube, black trash bags, a machete, and some other strange things. He claimed to be a newspaper man, and he would distribute the newspapers to my neighbors, yet the police never found one newspaper in his van when they had searched it. Needless to say, my dad ran a background check on him, and he had a shady past. Now, I'm not sure whatever happened to the man legally, but he never showed his face on that street again. However, whenever I stood there at the end of the street, all I could think about is if he had gotten the courage to step out of his van, I would have had no way to defend myself, and no one would have heard from me again. So to the man in the white van, I hope no pretty, cold teenage girl 
ever meets you again. This literally just happened to me, and now I'm sitting in my apartment. All the blinds are drawn, and the doors are locked. I live in a city, and I work third shift, so needless to say, I've seen some weird shit at night. Due to my schedule, even when I'm off, I'm up all night. That being said, I was in the military, and I've worked in security forever. So even though I'm a pretty skinny 5'7 female, I rarely get nervous being out and about at night. Anyway, I live alone with nobody to keep me company but my cat and my fur child, a 6 month old lab boxer. Around 4am, the pup went to the door and indicated he needed to go out. Now, him signaling that he needs to go pee is kind of a new thing so I jumped at the chance to take him outside. So I bundle myself up, I hook the puppy up to the leash, and out we go. To get to the stretch of land where the dogs are allowed to use the restroom, you have to walk past one of the other apartment complexes and up a hill. It's late, so it's dark, but the apartment parking lot, which runs alongside it, is well lit, so I've never felt nervous or that it was too dark. The pup starts to sniff around, and I light up a cigarette and watched with what was probably a disproportionate sense of victory as my dog pees outside. But suddenly, pup stops midstream. His entire body went still in a way I'd only ever seen concerning squirrels. His ears perk up, and his tail is straight up. Then, slowly, his ears started to pin back. His tail quivered, and a low, angry-sounding growl I'd never heard my pup make starts to begin. At the same moment, I felt the hair on my back and my neck stand up. Some long-buried instinct flared up, and I became instantly wary. I turned and put my back to the brick of the nearest apartment building and scanned the parking lot. Nothing. Nobody out walking their dogs. No one out throwing trash away or walking to their car. No one on their balcony. Pop's growling started to get louder and louder, and he'd actually started to lower his head. At this point, I'd gone completely still, and my reaction to his discomfort was so severe that I'd fallen back on old habits, and I'd curled the palm of my hand so I could hide the cherry of my cigarette so I wasn't giving off as much light. This is pointless, by the way, as I was out in a seafoam green north face and brown Uggs that stand out like a beacon in the darkness, never mind the fact that I was standing underneath a light. At this point, I'd pretty much decided to nope the hell out of there and head back to my apartment because I trust my dog's judgment of the situation. I started shuffling towards the walkway that would lead me back down to my entryway hesitant to even turn my back to the area, despite the fact I couldn't see anyone. To my surprise, Pup started following me without any complaints. Normally he would fight to tooth and nail to avoid going back inside. I didn't want to turn my back to the lot, but I also didn't want to just stumble backwards down the hill. Finally, I decided, screw it, and just swung around and walked briskly back to my apartment. As I was going up the outside stairs, my dog paused at the top landing just before I reached it, staring behind me. I punched the code to get into my building before turning around, holding the door open, and standing at the top of the hill is a guy. i never seen this guy before, but what the hell, I don't know everyone in the complex, but he was just standing there, watching me from the path I just walked and I had no idea where the hell he came from. Pup was still growling, and so I moved back, pulling him inside. I made sure the door was shut and locked, and then ran up three flights of stairs to my floor. I paused at the top, where there's a big window, and the guy moved further down the hill, and was just standing there, watching me. I backed up and passed the fire door, but I still didn't feel safe, even with it closed and me finally removed from the guy's sight. 
I ran back to my apartment and locked the door. I then called my apartment's 24-7 helpline, but despite the fact that it's called a 24-7 helpline, no one was there. So, anyway, I'm eating cookies with a huge-ass Bowie knife, watching Rocco's Modern Life. I always watch cartoons when I'm freaked out, and my poor pup probably still needs to pee. I have no idea how I'm ever going to take him out late at night, ever again. Two years ago, right around Halloween, I was babysitting for these two ladies who each had a son. They wanted to go out, so I stayed at one of their houses and watched their boys. It was around 8pm and the boys were sitting on the couch, playing on their iPads and whatnot. That's when somebody knocked on the door. I asked them if anyone was supposed to come over, and they both said no. So I go over and check the eye hole in the door, and it's some guy in a grey hoodie who's deliberately hunched over so I can't see his face. Immediately I'm like, nope, 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 and I don't say anything and start pacing around because I don't want to give him any indication that we're inside. A couple of minutes later I check outside the little window through the curtains, and he's gone. I didn't want to spook the kids anymore and there weren't any more knocks whatsoever, so I just kind of let it go as a prank. Cut to a few hours later, and the moms get back. They ask me how everything was, and I say the kids were great, but somebody had come to the door. They ask me what time it was, and I say around 8pm, and then one of the moms starts freaking out and going through her phone. The other one tells me that right around that time, somebody had been making strange phone calls to them on a blocked number, they had disguised their voice, and they were saying things like, I can see you through your window. They didn't think it was serious, because it didn't make sense in the context of where they were. But in retrospect, they were almost positive it was me he was looking at through the window. They escorted me to my car, and I touched base later on, and apparently nothing strange ever happened after that. But I'm just really glad I didn't open that door, because I have a feeling in my gut it would have been really bad. Hi everyone, I have been a lurker of Let's Not Meet for a few years, but I never thought I'd have a scary story that was enough to share until now. I want to preface this story by saying that I'm pretty used to casual harassment and creepy incidents. I'm 5 foot 2, young, blonde, and female. And I'm from a suburb of Chicago. I've had my fair share of weird guys saying things to me and feeling like I'm in danger, but this has been haunting me for quite a while. I go to college at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and I walk to all of my classes since it's good exercise, and the furthest one from my dorm is only 20 minutes away on foot. I take the same route to my 11 a.m. lecture every Friday. About two weeks ago, I was walking to my class, and I had one earbud in. I was minding my own business and jamming out, when I noticed a slightly beat up white pickup truck which was driving alongside me. This by itself wasn't scary, but there's a lot of construction happening on campus right now, and the truck itself had a generic symbol for a masonry company on the side, Marin bricks with a tacky font that said masonry. Here's where it gets weird. The truck slowed down to match the speed that I was walking at, but I attributed this to him wanting to pull into the parking lot, whose entrance was just a few feet ahead of me. I stopped to let him pull in, but he stopped too. I looked to the side of the driver, and it was obvious he was trying to make it look like he wasn't staring at me. He had a paper map unfolded in front of him, but I saw his eyes looking at me through the rearview mirror. He was an older man, about 60 years old, white. I started walking again, passing the parking lot, and then he began driving again, matching my pace like he did the last time. I sped up a bit, and he sped up as well. I could feel his eyes on me the entire time, and this is where I started to internally freak out. It's broad daylight, there's people around, 
and a creepy man is definitely following me in his pickup truck. I now began weighing my options. There are a lot of people around me, but if he tried something, I could probably take him out since I've taken self-defense classes before, or I could go inside a building and risk missing my lecture to wait for him to go away. Thankfully, a bus pulled up behind him and honked repeatedly, annoyed that this car was going 5 miles an hour on a 30 mile an hour road. The pickup truck now drove away. I returned to my dorm room after class and start researching. I looked up every masonry company in the area, scrolling through websites and Yelp reviews for a couple of hours, and I didn't find a single one with a logo like that one on the side of the truck. I told my roommate what happened when she got back, and she thought I should report it to campus police. I agreed with her and phoned it in. After being put on hold several times, they listened to my story and immediately rerouted me to the actual police department of the town. They sent an officer and his deputy to my room, and I recounted this story to them. The officer looked very concerned, and he agreed that I was indeed being followed. He now asked if I knew the license plate, and I mentally kicked myself because I had been too freaked out to think to take a picture of it. I gave a description of the truck and the driver as well, and offered to draw the logo from memory since I am an art student. The officers said that they increased patrols in the area at the same time the next few days, and if they saw a car matching that description, they'd pull him over. So, anyway, to the man in the white pickup truck, let's not meet again.